can just give a bit of background into your current role and what, what you do day to day? Sure. So I'm currently a, a lecturer uh, in strength and conditioning sciences at, at Deakin University. So um, I'm an academic by, by trade. So um, my role is both teaching and, and research. Um, so I'm not so much a practitioner, but um, my work involves teaching into our exercise and sports science course, teach mainly in subjects including exercise programming and exercise physiology. Um, so I guess trying to understand how the body functions during exercise um, and how we can use that information to inform how we prescribe exercise for improving sports performance or improving health. Um, so currently in, in an academic role and obviously performing some research um, as part of that as well. Um, previous to that, so I guess I did my PhD, uh, completed that in 2016 and that kind of led me into okay. my current um, academic career and, and prior to that had um, more practical um, experience, more in strength and conditioning based roles. Um, across various sports, but um, nowadays very much um, focusing on on teaching and research. You ever like so? Do you ever take um, learnings from when you were working as a practitioner to help you now with your research? Like any of the challenges you were facing then, or is it more um, kind of the challenges you see in the literature that that guide you now? So I think looking back, there was certainly um, you know some practical um, aspects that you know, trying to um, understand how we can optimise sports performance and, sure. you know, if we're talking about concurrent training, trying to integrate different um, modes of training into the same training program. There's, there's certainly yeah. challenges that you become aware of as a practitioner that you, you kind of think, you know, how much do we know about um, what the science says about what is, you know, optimal or, um, you know, at least part way to, to being optimal. Um, so there's certainly things that I can recall um, coming across as, as a practitioner, particularly with regards to concurrent training that kind of yeah. stimulated my interest in that area and trying to, to find the answers when, when often, you know, the answers might not have been there in the literature yet. So, so certainly, um, I think, having come from that um, practical uh, background, at least at the, at the start of my career, I think that uh, really helps when, when trying to to think about relevant research questions that can be easily translated back into practice for sure. Yeah, definitely. And getting that, getting the research into practice is absolutely key. If you're, if you're doing research that's going to help performance, then it's absolutely key that you can definitely get that translated for sure. Of course. So yeah, so you contributed to the concurrent training chapter in the Hit Science course and book. Um, why is it important to have strength training in a, in a sport, in, for example, for endurance athletes, if there is that interference effect, what, what benefits are there for the, for the athletes? Sure, so in terms of what we know about the benefits of, of strength training, um, you know, clearly that's gonna be most beneficial for improving our, our strength and our ability to um, you know, not only produce um, a high amount of, of maximal force, but also produce that force quite rapidly or improve our power development. Um, but we know now that that has important implications for endurance as well. And we know um, for endurance athletes that improving strength and, and power uh, become really beneficial in terms of improving our economy um, of, of our locomotion. So um, if we're improving our strength, we're also um, making um, our bodies much more efficient. Um, and, and for an endurance athlete, that's, that's really key. And that's a really key determinant of performance. So. Um, certainly for endurance athletes, strength training has been shown to, to cause a positive um, or have a positive effect on, on, on endurance performance. So um, it's certainly beneficial um, fr from that standpoint. Okay. And so in what ways does endurance training interfere with the strength development process? Yeah. So it's been known since the early 1980s that if you add um, endurance training on top of a, an existing strength training program, um, that you can get an impairment to um, aspects of resistance training adaptations. So primarily um, strength and, and power development, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also some evidence that, that muscle hypertrophy or muscle growth might be um, impaired as well. Okay. Um, so this has been variously called the, the interference effect or the concurrent training effect. Um, so basically something about that endurance training is actually having a negative impact on our ability to adapt to, to the resistance training stimulus. Okay, so is there like a hypothesis about what that something is? Is it 
you know, inside the cells, or is it something through the muscles or, or yeah. Yeah, I think that's, that's really key. I think in order to um, try and figure out how we can kind of, you know, solve the issue of mm-hmm. endurance training, potentially impairing some of our benefits of strength training, we really need to understand what, what the mechanisms are and, and, and what's causing mm-hmm. that effect. Um, and so ever since that first publication came out uh, by Hickson in, in 1980, there's been you know, a lot of research trying to find out what's, what's going on and a lot of different hypotheses. And certainly that's where my PhD work um, tried to fill some of those gaps. Um, so there's a couple of main kind of competing hypotheses, if you like. Yep. Um, the first one is that um, endurance training simply causes some degree of neuromuscular fatigue. Um, that kind of carries over and then when we try to do strength training uh, when we are fatigued the quality of those sessions is compromised or reduced okay. um, which means that you know we can't lift as much weight as we would normally uh, or we can't do as many repetitions with a given weight um, and if that is happening over time then the benefits of, of that strength training program or stimulus is, is going to be uh, potentially impaired so okay. that hypothesis has been called the acute hypothesis um which is essentially around that sort of residual neuromuscular fatigue so it's like um, if you were if you're training for example if you went for a run and then you went straight into the gym you're just going to be more tired so that's kind of like a it's quite a simple kind of idea but well, I, yeah. I understand it so it might be quite a simple idea yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that's the easiest um kind of hypothesis if you like to to, sure. to understand and, and convey um with regards to the concurrent training effect it's simply that you know if you're too tired to, to perform your strength sessions quality is going to go out the window and you're just not going, going to be able to lift as heavy or for as many repetitions for example um, as you could and if we're compromising that stimulus long term well potentially we're, we're not going to um, get as many benefits as we would um, otherwise sure. yeah. um, the other i guess more complicated hypothesis um, comes down to kind of what governs adaptations in the muscle at the at the muscle fiber and, and molecular level yeah and yeah. and what that hypothesis basically um suggests is that um the early responses in the muscle that we get to um, strength training and endurance training um as well as the long-term adaptations are kind of yeah. co- incompatible with each other um so for instance you know on one hand if you do a strength training workout um we're really interested in in trying to switch on a lot of the anabolic or growth promoting um, responses within the muscle um, that are um, you know consuming a lot of energy when doing that Mm -hmm. Um, very energy expensive whereas on the other hand when we do endurance training um, we're we're expending energy so we're 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 kind of um, potentially counteracting a lot of those growth promoting processes by trying to break things down and and be quite catabolic and energy releasing rather than kind of energy consuming Um, so from that standpoint there's kind of an idea that those acute early responses are a little bit contradictory to one another they don't really go well together okay Um, and then if you think long term kind of you know common adaptations to strength training one being muscle growth where we might get increases in the size of muscle fibers um, and there's a thought that that's not a good thing um, from an aerobic capacity standpoint when you're trying to Get things like oxygen and nutrients to the muscle fiber and then have to transport those within the muscle fiber if they have, okay. have to travel a longer distance um, then potentially that's not a good thing from an aerobic capacity standpoint so for both of those reasons this other hypothesis kind of says that if you've got endurance training happening around your strength training it's kind of going to take over and 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 put the brakes on a lot of those growth promoting type processes uh, which may result long term in, in limiting um, some of the benefits of, of strength training or the adaptations to strength training. Okay, so taking I kind of, I guess they both have similar implications for the training process. So, so what can a coach um, or an athlete, what can they do to minimise that interference effect? Yeah, sure. So I, I guess I should probably touch on it as well the the evidence for those two two mechanisms, and and I'm a little bit biased because I'm <laughs> tending to, to side a little bit more in one camp than the other. And sure. um, admittedly, a lot of my PhD was trying to look at whether or not there is evidence for um, kind of that chronic hypothesis in terms of that those, those short term um, effects being compromised um, when you're adding endurance training onto the the, the, the strength training and um, as we saw and a lot of what others are finding that that doesn't really seem to be the case. Um, So 
a lot of what the literature is suggesting and, and what we're finding is um, we really think that that, that residual neuromuscular fatigue um, is really key in determining whether or not we're going to see an interference effect um, with concurrent training. So okay. in terms of okay. practical recommendations, a lot of what we do recommend is really shaped around, around that hypothesis and trying to basically limit the, the amount of fatigue that an athlete might have going into their, their strength training sessions, if, if that's a key session that, that we really want to prioritize. Sure. Um, so if, if we're thinking about doing that, then um, you know the most obvious one is to try and separate out any endurance and strength training sessions as much as possible um, so allow as much recovery as possible in between those sessions that becomes quite challenging um, you know particularly for high level athletes that that are performing multiple sessions uh, per day uh, potentially but trying to separate them out as, as long as we can um, and if we are on the same day doing multiple sessions trying to do your strength training early in the day uh, when you are less fatigued. Um, yeah, but again, keeping in mind that, you know, in some instances, particularly for endurance um, based athletes, that often it's going to be the endurance sessions, like the hit sessions, that are going to be um, priority sessions. So um, in some cases, those, you know, would, would need to be prioritized and your strength training would have to take the back seat and, you know, potentially um, might have to accept a, a compromised session. Um, in some circumstances, but yeah, really trying to allow as much recovery as possible um, or doing your, your key sessions early in the day when you're, you're, you're less fatigued. Sure. So if there is that interference effect, is it even worth doing the strength training in the day or would you suggest kind of like, um, you know, moving it across to another to another day when you have less endurance? So like what I'm trying to ask, I guess, is is do the benefits outweigh the kind of the costs of of minimizing the impact, if that makes sense, of, of doing the two sessions? Or is it better just to kind of like do one and then move the other one to another day because of the, the lack of gains, if that makes sense? Yeah, look, I think if you have the luxury of, of doing them on separate days, that there's certainly evidence that that, that can um, lead to better adaptations than, than trying to do them on the same day. Okay. And I think that just speaks to that, you know, additional recovery time allowed between the two sessions. So certainly if you can spread out your sessions um, yeah. and you know so that they're, they're done on a different day I think that's that's certainly ideal but for mm -hmm. a lot of athletes that are simply trying to fit in too many training sessions to, to be able to do that yeah. um, I think then just trying to to increase that time window um, on the same day between okay. the two sessions and then trying to play around with the order um, mm -hmm. of the sessions on the day to, to, to try and get your key sessions done early uh, when, when you're least fatigued. Sure okay makes sense I mean I, I know personally that I struggle to fit in training so yeah it's, it's difficult for me as well but um sure. yeah it's interesting because obviously it's it's all about getting that recovery period but it's like i guess that's quite independent you know um context specific and individual um on ter in terms of how long that kind of recovery needs to be so i guess that's another challenge for, for athletes and coaches and researchers like yourself so yeah, of course, it's it's quite complicated, um, mm -hmm. but you know, based on available evidence, we 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 tend to, um, you know, and this does depend on quite a lot of factors, but you know, we tend to talk about this kind of six hour, um, six hour time window that you know, e even intense hit sessions, um, you know, we seem to see um, you know residual fatigue for at least six hours after that session, um, which tends to be resolved by about 24 hours post exercise and that's a okay. big generalization um, and does depend on you know a whole host of factors including the, the yeah. intricacies of that session the training status of the athletes how fatigued they were going into the session that kind of thing mm -hmm. um, but generally if you you know if you're doing sort of morning afternoon splits um, you know that are probably you know around about that six hour mark apart then that's oh. probably going to be you know a, a sufficient recovery time to allow between the sessions Okay, makes sense. I mean, I've got a question from, from one of our followers about CrossFit and how that kind of fits into the whole interference effect. Cause it's kind of like the whole, the whole sport is, is both endurance and strength. So just wondered if you had any insights into that. Yeah, sure. So I guess um, CrossFit's a, a pretty um, good example of, you know, where people can be um, performing at quite a high level with, um, you know, at least some form of endurance type um, activity and, and obviously being quite strong and, and powerful as well. Um, so, you know, clearly it is possible to, to be able to uh, be quite strong and, and quite fit from an aerobic perspective at, at the same time. And, and they do quite 
a good job at that. Um, you know, I think the big question is, you know, whether or not we would see um, them being a lot stronger, potentially if they didn't have a lot of that endurance training that they were doing um, and a lot of that high intensity work that they were doing at the same time. Um, you know, I think that's likely the case. Um, and that's sort of a big point with concurrent training that it's not like if you're trying to do both that, that one completely, you know, blocks out the other. You're still able to, to improve those um, capacities at, at the same time. Yeah. Um, it's just that there might be ways to adjust the prescription um, of, your, of your training as well as kind of the organisation of, of those two types of training in order to, to try and maximise the, the best of both worlds a little bit more. Sure. Um, but you know, CrossFit, you know, they're, they're, they're quite impressive athletes and, and clearly they're able to, um, to, um, you know, express, you know, high levels of strength, power and, and aerobic capacity. Um, but as I said, you know, whether or not they, they potentially would be able to be a lot stronger, um, if they weren't doing a lot of the metabolic conditioning, um, and that's, that's probably, that's probably likely, but, um, yeah. hard to say based on, based on the evidence at the moment. Is the, is the interference effect the same for like a low intensity session and a high intensity session with strength? Is there kind of any, any benefit of, for example, doing a high intensity session and a strength session on the same day, as opposed to doing a low intensity session and a strength session on the same day? Yeah, look, it's a good question. Um, I think there's certainly benefits. I think, I think it comes back to um, what sort of factors will influence the degree of fatigue that we might see from a hit session or from an endurance training session in general. Um, so there is, you know, evidence that the more intense, the higher the intensity of, of an endurance training session, the, the more likely there is to be some residual fatigue mm -hmm. from that session, um, which, which I guess makes sense. So, yeah. um, we would generally expect that the lower intensity, um, a, a, an endurance session, mm -hmm. um, the potentially the less, um, negative effect we might have on, on sessions that we might, on strength training sessions we might do later in the day. Yeah. Um, all else being equal, you know, it's kind of a, a generalization because you think if it, there was a lower intensity session, then likely the duration is going to be a lot longer. And then, mm -hmm. you know, that might add to the overall load and therefore, um, that would, um, potentially also complicate things. But I think in general, higher intensities are associated with, with greater fatigue. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, that might, um, if you're only doing your strength training, you know, two, three times a week, um, on those days, you might choose to, um, perform your, your kind of lower intensity endurance sessions on that day, mm -hmm. um, other than doing the high intensity work, um, that might lead to, to more of a, an, a sort of a short term interference effect on, on your performance during strength training. Sure. It makes sense. And I guess if you, if you keep that lower intensity session, but you know, shorter duration, so it's like you're maintaining, you're keeping it short and it's like, it just makes it the easier session. And then you've, you're focusing on the strength session for that, for that day being your kind of harder session. So. Of course. And again, it comes down to priorities. So you've, oh. um, you know, if, if, if strength is the priority for that day or in that block of training, then, then you're going to try and do whatever you can around that session to try and uh, preserve, I guess, the quality of that session. And, and the mm -hmm. opposite is going to hold true for, for key endurance blocks. And, you know, for, for the most part for, for endurance athletes, which clearly endurance training is going to be it's going to be the focus. you know you're not going to want to do a strength training session right before a, um, a key um, hit session or endurance training session either because you know there is evidence that 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 interference effect in terms of an acute interference effect the short-term effect does go the other way as well okay um so um you know that's something that's 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 really been underlooked you know a lot in the literature but uh but it is clear that um you know key hit sessions could be compromised by strength strength, strength training session done uh to to um close beforehand um, is that so like in the literature is that to do with like the technique so you're more likely to get injured or is it is it more to do with the kind of the fatigue and just the general kind of inability to to push yourself hard because of your you know the strength session you've just done yeah there's probably a few reasons but i think it, it does just come back down to that neuromuscular fatigue um and you know kind of the opposite to what i mentioned before in terms of the, the benefits of long-term strength training on endurance performance where it, that's oh. likely due to improving our economy if we're fatigued going into an endurance training session, it's likely that our economy is, is going to be um, impaired. And so that, you know, we, you know, we simply fatigue quicker and um, the quality of the session goes out the window. So, yeah. um, you know, aside from other factors such as potentially increasing injury risk, um, it, it probably just comes down to, to impairing economy during that session and, and therefore not being able to complete the session with, um, with as much quality as we, we otherwise would have.
people and i guess there's probably factors to do with like nutrition if you're using glycogen and stuff in the in the strength session and then you don't have enough time to recover that's going to affect your ability to to complete an endurance session as well so yeah definitely and and that's sort of another element to this in terms of nutritional considerations um you know i i guess if you've got a window of time between um endurance training sessions and strength training sessions you're going to do whatever you can to try and restore any of the um any of the factors that might have become depleted from from one of those sessions and um you know something like muscle glycogen depletion is, is certainly going to be something particularly if you're doing a kind of a high intensity um endurance training session um and then you've got a period of a few hours before you do strength training you know potentially trying to to top up those glycogen stores is going to be a good idea from from a resistance training standpoint later on and and, and vice versa as well so um you know certainly there's there's some nutritional considerations to be to be had as well i guess many of these factors are similar for like a team sport athlete but if if an athlete is trying to do a, for example a power session or like a sprint session or something and a strength session do they do they have an interference effect or they because they're kind of both working to to for hypertrophy and building power and building speed so do they kind of work together better than the endurance sessions um look i think um with your sprint training, I guess you, you, you are uh, perhaps training some of those neuromuscular um, mm -hmm. qualities, um, perhaps a little bit more so than you would be with your endurance session. So, so I guess there, there might be a little bit more similarities in the adaptations between say sprint type training and, and, and resistance training. Um, it's a good question. I mean, I'm not really sure of, of too much research specifically um, looking at that. I think still, if you were to do a sprint uh, type session, you know, uh, right before your, your strength training session, you, you, you're still going to get that um, short term impairment uh, in terms of performance due to that uh, residual fatigue. Um, so I think, um, yeah, certainly do them doing those types of sessions too close together is probably not a great idea from from a strength training standpoint. Yeah. Um, but in terms of what the long term implications of, of that would be, um, I'm, I'm not really sure that, that that's been, uh, been been looked at so far. Okay, so you're you're kind of touching on on gaps in literature. What kind of areas are you planning to do research in, or or do you think that they there needs to be research done in this kind yeah, of yeah, sure. So training? yeah, sure, sure. So you know what um we have tried to do uh in in some of our previous research and, and some of the work I've, I've done in my phd and, and kind of since then is is i guess trying to understand what the role of trying to manipulate different training variables is on the interference effect so um you know one example that i've looked at is is looking at endurance training intensity so you know if we use a higher intensity endurance training um protocol compared to a lower intensity does that actually have any um differential influence on the interference effect so okay. in other words does endurance training intensity matter when it comes to um, promoting interference so that if we can kind of find out which variables seem to be important we, we know which ones to manipulate in which way to try and uh tune down the, the amount of interference we might get so so that's something that we have looked at previously mm -hmm. Um, a lot of what we are looking at now is kind of going back to what I said before about neuromuscular fatigue being quite, quite critical, we think, for, yeah. for interference. Yeah. Um, and looking at how that fits with high intensity interval training prescription. Mm -hmm. um, so I said before, the higher intensity in endurance training session, the more fatigued we're likely to be. Yeah. Um, but the reality is for a lot of athletes, HIT is, is going to be part of their program and, and is, is certainly a, you know, an important part of, of, of um, of you know, most athletes programs so if we're going to use hit and if that's going to be most beneficial for performance um, then how do we actually manipulate um, our hit prescription variables to yeah. be most compatible with strength training essentially and, and and give us the best of both worlds so so what we're really trying to look at now is to better understand um, the factors that influence the neuromuscular demands and the neuromuscular yeah. fatigue we get from interval training from from hit um, mm -hmm. how to try and adjust those variables to try and turn up or down the, the levels of neuromuscular fatigue um, so we're doing some work on that um, at the moment trying to understand okay. uh, particularly with the different formats of hit um, you know we, we certainly do have an idea of which um, which are most demanding from a neuromuscular fatigue standpoint 
management, but, but we're looking at like, to try and understand the short-term fatigue effects of, of those hit formats. And then we've got some follow-up work planned to try and see whether or not that fatigue actually translates over to an impairment in strength training performance. Okay. So, you know, if we, if we know which hit formats are, are most fatiguing and least fatiguing from a neuromuscular standpoint, um, does that actually translate over to performance in, yeah. in strength training? Um, and then once we know that, the, the work we've got planned after that will then try and tell us, you know, if you've got um, a given hit session that results in, you know, a big impairment in strength training performance compared to another hit session that results in less impairment, if we perform those over a period of weeks, does yeah. that actually yeah. translate over to impaired adaptations? Um, so, you know, often a lot in research, we, we look at short term effects and assume that if that's repeated over time, then that's what we're going to get uh, long term. But, um, you know, the reality is that that's not always the case. So, um, so yeah, a lot of that work that we're going to be doing, trying to understand more about what, what turns up or down neuromuscular fatigue with HIT mm -hmm. and, and how that impacts on, on strength training performance and adaptations. Sounds like lots of interesting work to come. Is there much work yeah. currently looking at the interference effect in females and how, if that's any different to males? Or is that kind of another area of research that kind of needs needs people to, to look into it? Yeah, sure. Like I think like a lot of um, areas, um, you know, females are, are you know highly underrepresented in in, in research um, as as research participants. So, in terms of the potential sex differences in in concurrent training, um, I'm not really aware of any um, studies that have really looked at that. There, there's certainly some studies that have been done in, in female only co cohorts, yeah. but unfortunately they're, they're a minority, and I don't think there's been enough done to really try and understand whether or not there is any sex differences in. Um, you know, the interference effects um, with concurrent training, but, you know, certainly from the perspective of adapting to strength training, we know that in relative terms, males and females yeah. tend to um, see similar improvements in, in a relative sense in terms of strength and, and muscle growth, etc. cetera. Um, so I would, you know, think that there, there would be similar, um, I guess, degrees of interference yeah. that we might see with males and females, but, but to my knowledge, it hasn't been extensively researched. Well, I guess that's another area for someone else to look into in the future. For sure. For sure. So. No, definitely.